I'll actually start the webinar. I'll share a screen first. This will come up in a minute. Internet's a bit slow today. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. I have, yeah. Come on. There we go. There we go, yep. Now, did we lose the... Are you seeing slideshow or are you just seeing the... the... I'm seeing the four slides you have here. Well, I'm wondering why we're doing this. That's not gonna let you do that. Let me stop the share. This is, we have nine people you. in. I have to apologize to everyone. We seem to have a slight technical issue. So I see nine people in there. Let's see who we've got in. Um, I, see, I'm going to um, make you a panelist. I just made you a panelist. You're going to rejoin us. And then I'm going to share screen again. What in the world is going on here? And let me share a screen. Frank Smith, all panels, pan, 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 PowerPoint needs to share. Yes, I know. Hey, Frank, I've got a bit of a problem um, that I'm working through. Let me share a screen. Go to PowerPoint. There we go. Um, very good. This is Joan Conover, and this is Seven Seas Cruising Association. And we are a minute away from starting, but I think I'm going to start because we have nine people in. We have Beth Bandigan, and she's the host. And we have Zia Gunn, who is going to talk on the Anchorage north of Annapolis. The Chesapeake uh, River narrows south of Bay Bridge will be Beth. And then I'll talk a little bit about Hampton and Norfolk. Thanks to our sponsor, Nauticat. Um, sign up through SSCA, there's free courses and they have certificate courses, which we're investigating to see if it will cover the requirement in Florida for the boating course that they want to have for an international boating course, but that's uh, kind of to, to be determined. And Seven Seas, you'll find our um, events on the web, um, on our website. Hampton will have a event March 24th, that's free. You can learn what's going on in Hampton. We have a cruise to Maine, March 26th, that we'll talk about um, cruising to Maine, the details with our hosts and, and people who are actually in the ports there and knows what, know what is going on. And of course, the second Saturday each month, Beth hosts her events. I'm going to stop the share, and I'm going to turn it over to Beth. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm trying to see who's all here. Get a good screenshot with everybody. I see Joyce and Zia, and see Galley View. Sorry. There you go. Um, so I, there's seven people on, I believe. I see Frank Smith. Hi, Frank. Joan, it's Joyce and Zia. Do we have anybody here from the Harrington Harbor Sailing Association? Well, if so, welcome. Um, I know some of you guys are going to try and uh, to, to uh, join us uh, this morning. So um, this is part of our series of the um, Seven Seas Cruising Association um, monthly luncheon series that we do. We used to meet monthly at the Leeward Market in um, Eastport, um, Annapolis. But obviously, due to the pandemic, we've all had to um, do this format for the time being. And I'm really hoping that we can get back to Leeward Market sometime come summertime. They do have a really nice outside picnic area. So hopefully we can meet there. We always meet the second Saturday of uh, the month at noon. And there's a question, someone's got a hand up. 
Yes, no? Can everybody hear me okay? I see a thumbs up there, great. Do you hand up, Zia? Yeah, you guys can go ahead and unmute yourselves. So anyway, so what I wanted to do with this, we have, every month we typically have a topic that we discuss and we've been kind of kicking around the idea of, um, hey, there's Bell, welcome Harrington Harbor folks. Um, we thought we'd like to do a talk on some of the cruising grounds of the Chesapeake Bay. And this is a lot, this is a big, big topic to cover, but a lot of us have a lot of knowledge about our favorite gunk holes and our favorite areas to, to drop anchor. And this is a great time to start planning because I know we're all thinking about where we want to go once the weather gets a bit warmer. And um, in terms of cruising guides, before I, get, before I put Desi on, in terms of cruise, cruising guides, there's two guides that I really recommend for anybody who's new to cruising the Chesapeake Bay. The Waterway uh, Guide, Chesapeake Bay Waterway Guide, does a great, um, they have a great publication to do, and it's updated annually, which is really good. They have a lot of really good uh, authors and people who add to that. That covers, I think, Cape May, New Jersey, all the way down to Norfolk. Um, I do like it. It's, I like the fact that it's annually updated because most of you know Chesapeake Bay, things do change quite a bit down here. Um, and that's about, I think it's about $45 for a copy of that. So it's money well spent. And they do talk a lot about gunk holding and anchorages. The other one is the Chesapeake Bay Cruising Guide that's put out by Chesapeake Bay Magazine. And that's also a very good one. They're both excellent. Um, and I believe the Chesapeake Bay one's done every two years. So that's probably the difference of the two of those, unless anybody has other information that I don't have. But they're great references. Um, we have copies on our, our boat and... Uh, it's great when it's the end of the day and you're like, oh man, I'm not going to make that anchorage I was planning on going to because I'm fighting the current and tide and where else can we go? Quick, uh, quick look to see where we can drop the hook. So anyway, welcome to everybody again. I see a few people popping in here. Um, Larry Brown. Hi, Larry. Welcome here to Harbor folks. Uh, and I'm glad you guys could join us. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Joyce and Zia Gunn and Joy, uh, Zia's got a little bit of a slideshow I think he's going to do for us. Is that right, Zia? about the favorite, you've got some anchorages that uh, on the north of the Chesapeake Bay and Zia and Joyce spent a couple weeks this past summer exploring some of the areas up there. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Zia and Joyce. Good morning, everybody. This is a very special weekend for us. We are seven our anniversary. So we're coming to you live from St. Michael's. Oh, I'd like goodness. to give you a view of our room. Nice. <laughs> That's the harbor. You got it. You got yeah. it? Okay, yeah, yeah. so back to boring stuff to us. <laughs> uh, something like that. Uh, oh, I missed it up. Sorry about that. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to start with this slideshow. It's basically, uh, we are members of the uh, Babadier Yacht Club, and we have some uh, old salts in the organization, and they said, you know, about a good portion of the people never leave this slip. Why don't you write about what you've done? So what we're going to present today came from that request. It might be to some extent to preach into the choir, but here it goes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to do um, screen saving or screen sharing. Let's see how that goes. Here's my PowerPoint. I couldn't understand you. <laughs> okay. Share screen. And... Here. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, that's the uh, title. So this happened uh, last year and two years prior, we decided to, at the end of the GAM, come to the uh, 20, uh, 20 GAM by boat, made reservations, took our vacations from work and it got canceled. So here we have one week off and no place to go. And so Captain Joyce says, let's go. So taking the plunge, we say, well, that's the first time we're going to actually take a more than overnight or weekend, you know, cruise. Let's do that. And we decide to um, look at different combinations between our uh, anchorage, mooring ball, and slips. So comes the next preparation. And like Beth was saying, I spent quite an amount of time looking at two publications, the Chesapeake Bay Guide and then the uh, paper chart. And looking at those uh, two uh, sources, plus the electronic uh, Navianics, did some preparations, uh, selection of the uh, venues, 
uh, talk about the sailors, go around iterative fashion, what works, what doesn't. And then we decide, well, let's go and suck up the boat. So with the next slide is my out spreadsheet. What I wanted to do, some guidelines was we didn't want to spend any more than six hours or 30 miles per leg. How can we find some places to go, where to go, where to stop? So next slide is basically mass droppings of everything we did, kind of very busy. We started over here at uh, BYC, Belvedere Yacht Club on the Magath River, went all the way around and came back. That so on a day-by-day day basis, first day was BYC to Rock Hall. It's an easy trip, our favorite location to go to, great rockfish we claim that it is probably one of the best rockfish anywhere we go there often it's an easy ride uh we left the, uh, our uh, yacht club out of the magath river straight shot across here there is a little sandbar actually quite a large sandbar you have to come on the south and go inside the actual uh, harbor is very exposed we picked up a moon ball, thanks to the best recommendation, on the back side, which was very quiet. And it's a, an easy way to, for us to ease, uh, ease into our, our weekly uh, trip. So a couple pictures, some slides. We get there, easy. The challenge was how to launch the, uh, our dinghy. Um, we don't have a davits on the boat, so I had to hoist it and then toss it overboard and catch it. So we gave some cheap entertainment to people at the harbor, but we managed. We got back on shore, got a nice dinner, and that was the first day. It wasn't a small feat hoisting the dinghy um, <laughs> for the first time over the side. Um, in fact, there was a brief second where you almost went in. <laughs> oh, and overboard, pulled yeah. it. That would be real entertainment for the uh, people there. We got there about cocktail hour time, so I'm sure they were watching us having a chuckle. Yeah, you, you figured out a system for the next time. You managed it. Yeah. On the second day, we but left. Uh, is there a question? On the second day, we decided to go from Rock Hall up north. And this is of interest to you. There is a um, sandbar, but if you draw about five feet or less, there's a shortcut across the sandbar. There are two uh, uh, range lights. If you line them up behind you and there's a dotted line that comes across the sandbar, that's a shortcut. So you can actually see on the chart, come across, that's what we did. What you see on my charts is the trace of my route from point A to point B using Navianics. It is not the actual, uh, what we traveled, but it gives you some idea our uh, destinations. So we came out, cut across, very calm day, Hard any wind, we ran the engine. And we were going up north. There are a couple options. And someone at the yacht club recommended a place called Still Pond. It's an incredible place. Show a few, few pictures. Entrance is very narrow. As you approach uh, Still Pond, there's a cove on the starboard side. Anyone can go drop anchor there. However, if you trust your chart and the depth gauge and drive straight to the shoreline, now you see a bunch of markers and a little gazebo and a red marker right on the on land. It's about five feet there. You can go around inside the pond. It opens up. And once it does, it is gorgeous place. There's a picture there at sunset. We, we loved it. We love to get back, back there again. So if you want to explore, uh, Still Pond is a fantastic place on the eastern shore going up north. Highly recommended. Very quiet. You are the only boat there. Now, the local knowledge is that people come there on weekends during the summertime with power boats, gets crowded. But for, uh, for us, it, it was fantastic. So that was a very nice night. And that was an alternative to going to Wharton Creek. We decided to go to uh, Still Pond. We absolutely loved it. Next day was from Still Pond coming out to uh, Sassafras. We never been there, so we figured I'll uh, get up there. The initial plan was to make the Sassafras and back. So I, I broke down into increments, trying to stay six hours or you know 30 miles. That's why I went to Still Pond. 
again, coming from um, still pond out on the bay, back in the uh, river, it was uneventful. The only time here was we were running parallel to the shipping channel. Our boat does not have ARS, so I use a web-based application, marinetraffic.com. With some delay, it let us know who was coming. The only ship of interest was a small a, a Coast Guard buoy tender, and we saw miles away, and that was no challenge. So we, we go in this uh, river all the way around, up and down, all the way to the bridge, picked up a mooring ball. Great place, uh, besides being fresh water, there is a free water taxi run by the marina. You just hail them, they pick you up, put you on shore and take you back. There's our boat at Anchor Marinas, uh, oh, a couple of marinas, there's a big uh, catamaran. On shore, we went to a restaurant that's looking down at the harbor. Beautiful place, very calm, very quiet, highly recommended. But Sassafras is a hike, it's about 10 miles, five miles stretch straight, five mile meandering. So it is a good day, you go, you go up there and commit yourself to staying. Coming out was an uh, interesting day for us. The initial plan was to go to um, Bohemia. Bohemia, but we abandoned that very quickly. Um, it was a very windy day. As we come out, the plan was to come out all the way out to the bay and then go up the next creek over. Next river, yeah. By the time we come up here, it was very windy, we decided to abandon the trip. Yep. Referring to our um, Chesapeake guide, where do we find a safe anchorage? It's at Turner Creek, which happens to be where we happen to be at that time. Turned in, again, Turner Creek is, you have to trust the Chesapeake uh, tr cruising guide. There's plenty of water coming in, but the deep water is on the starboard side by the sea grasses. It's about eight to nine feet of water by the sea grass. The other side of the entrance, it's about three feet. So really look at your um, chart, look at your uh, depth gauge and trust it. Once you get in there, it's a phenomenal place, well protected, and we spend the night there, if after a night there. Here's a picture, it's a beautiful place. Day after day five, we decide, well, let's continue to have the grace. Let me uh, backtrack. Initial planning, we said, let's go to uh, Maryland City on the uh, canal. Several people advised us against that due to strong current. We just abandoned that idea. We didn't have to go in that direction. We said, instead, let's go up to Harvard Grace. Uh, it was very narrow. Once you get to the uh, flatlands, it's basically a direct channel and then a couple of feet on each side. You just follow that. Uh, you cannot get lost. I mean, there's no option, but follow it. You get up to the um, town, beautiful town. There is no place to drop anchor that we found out. So I reserved a, a slip. We were told that at the marina, there is a bulkhead. I was very excited about that. Just pull up. Turns out to be bulkhead to them was you go inside their marina, pass everything and tie up in between other boats. It was kind of challenging. Uh, it's kind of funny story. Once we get there, this is at the height of the COVID. September, October, the uh, lady helping us had a face mask. So she's yelling instructions from the shoreline. I have no idea what she's saying. So we got lost inside, turned around. We found something in the wrong direction. I said, I'm not moving. I'm here. I tied up. We stayed there. We spent the night, went to a restaurant, beautiful place. And the next day, we decided to get the uh, we turned southbound from Harvard Grace to Middle Creek. It was the best day of sailing. We had steady wind, uh, 10 to 15. We had a couple of uh, big tacks across the bay and then favorable wind, single tack starboard came all the way down. It was phenomenal. We reached on our little 31 foot, uh, 6.7 knots under sail. We were flying that day. I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. Loved every minute of it. As we came to Pools Island, we realized that the head sail had jammed. We couldn't pull it back in. Next hour, I fought with that, trying to pull the sail in. In the meantime, we were going against the wind with the head sail you know, stuck. So we had this very effective uh, windbreaker with the engine within about three knots. 
But by the end of the uh, journey, right before sunset, the line came loose. We pulled into um, Stew Creek where uh, Baltimore Yacht Club is situated. This is coming from the um, uh, Harvard Grace uh, area. Sailing, sunset, absolutely fantastic place. Loved every minute and then dropped anchor in front of um, Maryland Yacht Club. Again, that's a fairly narrow area. There's a channel which we avoided right outside. It gets shallow, but we found enough water to drop anchor for about four foot boat, spend the night. And the next day was uh, coming home from Sioux Creek back to BYC. Uh, no wind, we just ran the engine and there we are. Uh, the final uh, notes is that for our uh, river, Magatha River, these are our favorite places we like to go to. Uh, this is not meant to be a journey. I'm just using it as a mouse droppings to denote the locations. Coming from our um, yacht club, there is a little pond kind of hidden and the entrances looks like you're going between two houses. But once you clear that, there's a pond area, fairly small, maybe three or four boats can drop anchor. Was a great location for a short hop. Across there, there is another one, narrow entrance, but once you clear it, fairly open area. This is our favorite. You come from our, our creek, go around this shawl, follow the markers. And there's a big glass house there as a landmark. You drop anchor there, well protected, very quiet. The other favorites are, you go behind Gibson Island, there's Dobbins, very popular area during the summertime, lots of boats. A few years ago with our other boat, we dropped anchor at Dragged. At the time I was using Danforth. Now my primary is uh, Plow, so I would recommend using Plow in this area. Other one is go beyond um, Gibson Island, very popular anchorage, gets very crowded. If you don't get there in early afternoon, not a chance to get a uh, slip, lots of <coughs> up going on here. Probably um, on a good day, 50, 60 boats. Um, just think about that. If this area is not uh, too full for your uh, comfort, which was for us a couple of times, you can go around up this uh, little uh, area, little creek, very quiet. So these are our local stomping grounds and that's all we have for today. That was great, Zia. Thank you. Hey, like um, I said, this was meant for um, people who don't leave the uh, slips. So it's kind of like preaching to the choir. I, I have nothing to tell Beth about how to prepare. I mean, <laughs> this is the wrong uh, audience, but it, it's, that's what we did. Yeah, that's, that was fantastic. Thank you. I love it. It was a great slideshow. Thank you. Um, anybody have any questions for Joyce or Zia about their travels in that area? Uh, what's your draft? You said you're about five feet. We draw four foot, it's an island packet, a full kill four foot. So if anything shows uh, five or less, I'm kind of nervous. Five, I go very slowly and we made it. A couple of times we bump the bottom, it's always has been soft. You just pop and reverse, you're out. The two places are you have to be careful is, one of them is, well, coming from our uh, yacht club is very dicey. There's a big sandbar, it's about five foot. So if I, kind of drag bottom, I uh, get on my VHF, let my buddies know, careful out coming out today. The uh, still pond is beautiful place, but it's about five foot. Where we went. Where we went. So for some of us that are a bit deeper, we just pay more attention to our charts and pick areas that don't, that we can go to safely. Like we're six <laughs> foot, so on our draft, and it's a big boat, we don't go to a uh, full harbor. I see Frank was going to say something. I was just waiting, Joan. Uh, still harbor. I was just in the last fall, and uh, there's a lot of room, but like you said, it can get fairly crowded in there, too. Uh, but the holding's really good, so you don't need to wind up getting really cavalier with 100 feet of scope or anything. Just put enough down to safely get your scope numbers up, and you'll sit well protected. It's a 360 protected hole, which is nice. Yeah, we dropped it at uh, three to one for overnight. It was very calm night and it was good enough. Oh, other thing, again, this is preaching the choir. Get some heavy work gloves for uh, anchor work. Joyce drops the boat, I dropped and pulled the anchor 
and it comes out slimy. So I got heavy leather gloves on the boat for anchor work. <laughs> Yeah, that's the one thing I was going to add about, and I think those of you on this call again probably know this. I mean, the anchoring grounds the Chesapeake Bay, it's really different. The farther north you go, the more mucky and muddy it gets. Um, and we, again, use two different anchors too. Um, you know, we usually use the, the plow for the muddy anchor. And then once we're to the south of the bay, which is more sand, you know, we're using our mantis just because it digs into the sand a lot better. But it's surprising how different the anchoring techniques are um, with that. And I think I was just gonna add two things to the section that Joyce and um, uh, Zia went through, a couple of the creeks in there. Um, I don't know if any of you had any familiarity going into Fairley Creek or Wharton Creek. Um, if you do, my recommendations are this, Fairley Creek, Fairley Creek and Wharton Creek are, are very popular anchorages for the Baltimore boaters um, come summer and they're, they're quite crowded, both of them are. Fairly Creek is very large once you get in there, but getting in there is super tricky. And um, it's got a four to five knot current going in. So unless you've got some serious power on your engine, you need to time that with the tide rushing in, not coming out. Also, it's one boat at a time that can pass that way. And I, there's no way, a nice way of saying this, but there's a lot of boaters who don't understand the nautical rules and they will just come through whenever and don't understand that your sailboat with limited maneuverability. So <laughs> when we come in, we come in basically with the current and we just, I stand at the bow with the boat horn and just say, I'm coming through, get out of my way. Um, there are people who stand and there's a very narrow channel of about maybe 15, 20 feet. Um, and people stand there on paddle boards and canoes and they're sitting there watching people go back and forth, but it's, it's a tricky entrance and it's always gives me a lot of anxiety <laughs> just going in there. So I, we don't go in there much anymore. It's just bad, bad boaters behaving badly in there. Um, they don't set their anchors well and they drag. So if you do go in there, my advice is to mind your current, mind your tides. Um, it's read up, read up on it before you go in there. And once you go in there, go way past the marina. It's a large, large anchorage. It's go way past the marina, past the boaters. And you can get some really nice um, anchor anchoring in about anywhere from nine to 10 feet of water back in there. So that's good. Um, and Frank, do you have anything to add on that? Sounds like you've been up in that area. I've been in that area a good bit. I can't actually fit up in that particular section because of my beam. Right. I, yeah, right out, I rank it right out front, and we were able to snag a boat that was dragging out all the way out through the creek mm -hmm. uh, because they hadn't set their anchor properly. Uh, it, there is a good honking current that'll come cruising out through there when the tide drops. Yeah. Anybody That's else fine. have a knowledge they want to share about those areas? I just have a question about your anchors. Go, yeah. go ahead. Um, you uh, said that you use your mantis down in the sand, but you use a plow up in the muck. Why not it's use just, the mantis? Because I can't get it up. Seriously, we have a, we have uh, a, a, we have a, we have a, you know, we have everything electronic and we can't get that. In. It digs in so deep in that mud, we can't get it up. And it's, we have to hover over it and slowly bring it up. And the windlass is just straining and the breakers shoot and it, it's, it's a mess. So we've learned that. And we have a 45 foot boat, Freedom, and she's a pretty heavy boat. So the plow anchor is just fine. It holds it really well. And we've never had any knock wood. We've never dragged with that anchor up in the Northern Bay, north of the Bay Bridge. South of the Bay Bridge, we've dragged. And that was before we had the mantis put on and that was anchoring in sand. And um, that's kind of a whole different animal down that way. Um, any other questions? What are you talking about? Sorry? How far south are you talking about? Because we plan a trip this uh, summer going down to Salmons. So what would you recommend uh, anchoring that going down to Salmons? Yeah, once you, I didn't really encounter, Frank, you've probably got more knowledge in the southern part of the bay here, and we can probably jump into that now. But um, I didn't find a lot of sand until I got probably a little bit south of the Rappahannock. Um, that I found more, predominantly more sand up in the Fishing Creek up near Deltaville, um, Gwyn Island, those areas are, the Gwyn Island's all sand. And that's really tricky to get the anchor down in there. So um, that's kind of, yeah, again, we, we've sailed the bay multiple, you know, for many, many years just on the plow and we've done fine. We, we put the mantis on when we went to Caribbean and obviously brought it back with us. And we found that, oh, this holds a lot nicer. But as someone mentioned, we were using the mantis over the summer and the anchor got stuck, we couldn't get it up. And that was like really frustrating. So we just stick with the plow. Um, 
All right, let's pop into a little bit about, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about my knowledge of the Chester River and I don't have a pretty slideshow to show you, so bear with me. The Chester River, um, for those of you who've not experienced it, is one of my favorite rivers on the Chesapeake Bay and she is just north of the Bay Bridge on the Eastern shore. Chester River terminates in Chesterstown. And if you're entering the Chester from the, the, the Chesapeake Bay, to get to Chesterstown, that's a two day trip. There's no way you're gonna make it one day unless you have a very long day and you've got amazing wind. It's a very tidal river um, and it's got a fair amount of current to it, um, but there's beautiful anchorages. So as you come into Chester, Chester is beautiful. It's open, it's wide. Um, there are a lot of very large power boats and I'm talking 60 to 80 footers that plow right up the bay and they're gonna give you a bit of a wake. But once you get past that initial entrance, um, you're good to go. As you come in, um, there's Queenstown to, which is past. So the entrance to the Naps Narrows is where people go through the Naps Narrows bridge to connect to um, the uh, Eastern Bay. But if you're going up the Chester River, the two anchorages that I highly recommend you checking out, um, the first one is the Cors Corsica River. And the Corsica is about a good day sail from the mouth of the Chester River. And it's about, I would say maybe 10, 15 miles up the river and it's on the southern or I guess easternmost part of the river. It's very well marked. Um, the, if you look at your waterway guides, they will, they will tell you what, how, which markers to, to mind as you come in there. Um, it's a wonderful holding bottom. It's very protected. There's some big high heels, hills in there as you deep in there. So if you have a blow coming, it's a pretty good anchorage to, to get up in there. It's, it's fairly peaceful. To the north of the Chester, I've read across the Chester River um, from the Corsica is Langford Creek, and this is also one of my favorites. And as you come up to Langford, it splits to the east and the west. And on the western part of the Langford, there's an island in the middle. It's called Kekwe Island. And it's a very popular area over the summer. If you have a dog, it's a great place to go because a lot of people bring their dogs there um, to kind of do their thing, even though you're not supposed to do that. People do it anyway, and I've never heard of any issues. As you come to the west, so Dobbins, or not Dob, Dobbins, a Kakwa Island's in the middle to the western shore. You can go up that way. There's a nice marina up in there to get ice and provisions if you need to do it. On the eastern part of Langford Creek, on the eastern fork, there's a, as you go past the island um, to your port side, there's about five miles of totally isolated anchorages up in there. And the very first time I anchored in there, I was thinking of um, you know, if I hear banjo music, I better get out of here. Um, it was actually kind of it was unbelievable in the middle of summer. We were the only boat up in there. Great holding bottom, very mucky. So you're going to hold well. And it's a great anchorage um, for a blow. As you're coming, and then of course, Chesterstown is the terminus of the river that you can get into. It's got a fixed bridge, but most people this far, this is going to go to Chesterstown. If you get a chance to explore that, it's a wonderful, wonderful town. I would highly recommend if you do go to Chestertown to get a slip um, at the marina because it's very tidal and there's a pretty strong current up in there. And I've seen a lot of, it's very deep too. And I've seen a lot of boats drag. So you got to put a lot of, um, lot of chain down to get your anchor to hold well and be prepared, not only for your boat to potentially drag for some of the drag into you. So again, when we go up there, we just bite the bullet and get a slip and walk into town. So um, I would highly recommend transferring that area, um, transgressing that area if you do get a chance. So as you're coming down the Chester River, your options are to go out into the bay and go around Kent Island, or you can cut through the Narrows. And I don't know if anybody on the Zoom call has gone through the, the, the Kent Narrows. It's a little hairy. Um, first of all, there's a fixed, there's two bridges. There's, there's one that opens on the half hour during season. And um, again, that's, it's got a lot of current going in there. So the boats are kind of vying for waiting time for the, the bridge to open. And people are kind of like literally doing a dance around each other. So you want to time that. So that bridge opens on the half hour, so hour and a half hour during the summer season, which I believe they go from April one to the end of October, but that's, that should be indicated in your guide. And, and then after that time, you have to call the bridge tenant for an opening. So, and, but right before that is a 50 foot fixed bridge. So if your mast is taller than 50 feet, that's not an option and you need to go around, but it will save you, it'll save you a good six hours trying to go around to get up the Eastern Bay if you can get through that area. But um, again, just keep in mind, it's, there's a lot of current, there's a lot of motion. There are unfortunately some very bad behaving boats in there. And again, people who don't really understand nautical rules. Uh, uh, Zia, I got a question? Just a comment. Not only that, there are very popular bars there. There are <laughs> lots of power boaters who go to the bar just like driving a car, when they come out, they will zip through. And as you sit there, find the current for the bridge to open for your turn, they are going every which way. So 
I would highly recommend that look around, give some extra room. One time we were just waiting for about 20 minutes for the bridge to open, but constantly drifting back with the current. And it, it was hard until they opened up and also this boat came out of nowhere and just passed by us. Mm -hmm. Bill, Bill has a question? Yeah, hi, how are you? Good, um, how are you? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely day. Uh, a pre-boating kind of day. Um, so just a, a few quick thoughts. Um, you can, if you go up the Corsica, uh, it narrows and then it thins, but just before it narrows and thins, uh, there's several anchorages, which also have some dog friendly shores. Um, and then you can take your dinghy up to Centerville and there's a very nice um, restaurant there. So that, uh, we finally uh, got around to it because we, we just recently got an electric outboard for the dinghy and uh, it made the trip really well. Uh, the other aspect with Wharton uh, of the places, again, if you have a dog, Wharton has a great sandy little uh, beach under, the, uh, under that hill or, or cliff area, which is very dog friendly. So we kind of look at dog friendly spots. Um, the last yeah. comment is at Chestertown. Uh, there's a great French bakery called Evergreen. And uh, mm -hmm. they just, even in COVID, uh, they're open, but they only have outdoor seating. And uh, to me, that's worth the trip alone. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Bill. Again, for those of you who've not transgressed the Chester River, I would I would highly recommend spending a long weekend. You could spend a week up there. It just meanders, it winds. Um, it's beautiful. It goes past farmlands that aren't developed. And like I said, ends in Chesterstown, which is a wonderful old colonial town. It's a great um, walking town. Lots of fun stuff to do up there. All right. So thanks. That was great. Thanks for that input, you guys. And then so so again, my next, the, the topic I want to, again, we could, we could spend a whole talk and just talking about places to go, anchorages for dog friendliness. We traveled with our dogs as well um, until late. So it's, we've always had those things in mind, how to get the dog to shore and where he go without disturbing other people and certainly not private land. Um, so south of Kent Island, you're in the Eastern Bay. And I think most of you know that St. Michael's is where most people go. Um, St. Michael's is wonderful, except in the summertime. <laughs> um, when it's so crowded by mega yachts and a lot of boats. I mean, it, it's really tough to get an anchorage in St. Michael's. Um, I would recommend if you do want to go up in there, um, the marinas are extremely expensive. They're uh, close to $4 a foot in season for a slip and sometimes even more than that. So it's kind of tough. You can, a couple options. One is you could become a, mar a member of the Maritime Museum, which is there, the St. Michael's Maritime Museum. I think it's the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. Um, and I, your membership as I believe is a hundred dollars, but that allows you privileges to um, use their marina. They have, a, they have about maybe a little 12 or, 12 or so slips there and allows you, you still have to pay a slip fee and the slip fee is not bad. It's like a dollar and a half a foot, but it allows you ground access, allows you museum access and a slip access. So it's kind of worth, worth your bang for the buck. If you do decide you want to transgress that area a lot, you can drop anchor um, right outside of, there's a big fancy hotel up there. I forget the name of that um, hotel. And there's a room for maybe four or five boats in there, but you, if you don't have your anchor set, you're gonna drag. It's, it's a pretty dug up anchorage and it's top. So St. Michael's is a great place to visit. If you do wanna try St. Michael's, I would recommend you do the back. There's a back entrance to that, which I'll talk about in a bit. The other anchorage that we really love, and you guys, if you've never had a chance to do this, explore this, is the um, Y River. And the Y River is stunning. It's, a, it's on the way to St. Michael's, it's up the Eastern Bay. And again, there's a lot of anchorages, the Y River, you could spend an entire long weekend just exploring the Y River. Y Island is the middle of it. And um, another great dog place to go because it's an island and nobody else goes there. Um, anyone have anything to add on the Miles River? Eastern Bay, so, yeah. If you happen to be a member of a yacht club and your yacht club reciprocates, there's Miles River Yacht Club just a few miles from the St. Michael's town. We took a slip there. They're extremely welcoming. There's a pool restaurant. And so that's another a possibility if you are a member of a yacht club, essentially any yacht club on the bay, they reciprocate with, they're very friendly. BBYCA clubs. 
there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good news. I always forget about it. a lot of the yacht clubs do reciprocate. So, you know, ask ahead. It's a lot, a lot of good information. Beth, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, this is Stefan Leader from the Harrington Harbor Sailing Association. I can't, uh, for Welcome. some reason, I'm having trouble getting my video on. But um, yeah, there are a couple of places beyond St. Michael's on the, um, on the miles. Uh, I've led cruises up into uh, Hunting Creek, which has a lovely um, a beach. And we like to go in there. Um, and it gives you a, essentially a view back across the miles into St. Michael's. Um, uh, and that's one very nice place. No. How far past St. Michael's is that roughly, would you say? Not more than a mile or two. Good. So on the port the side, you, you go around, make a left turn with the river. Okay. And the right. entrance is immediately on your port side. Um, I've, I've got Google Maps up and I'm watching so that I'm seeing everybody's and, and, and it's, it's almost right in front of uh, St. Michael's. Nice. Good. So how's the holding bottom up there? Pretty good? I've never had a problem. Good. Okay, good. Excellent. Yeah, so that does a great, there's a lot of great anchorages up in there. It's just, it's quite popular in the summer. I love St. Michael's, I truly do, but in the summertime, I kind of stay away from it. And I'm more inclined to go there in the fall, you know, after the big mega yachts are gone and everybody else is kind of out of their way and things are quieter. Yeah, um, Beth, you did say you were going to talk about the back way into St. Michael's, which is the only way we go to St. Michael's <laughs> these days. Yeah. And that is San Domingo Creek off the chop tank. Yeah, go for it. Why don't you give us some intel on that? I've only been up there a couple times. Oh, well, it gets you to within perhaps a half mile of uh, a back way into St. Michael's. Uh, and it's a short walk into the center of town once you dinghy in. Um, the Anchorage has got lots of good holding. Um, just the problem that the creek gets shallower as you get further up. And so you have to uh, pick your spot uh, carefully, um, and then dinghy uh, to the. Uh, there's a fisherman's dock. Um, at uh, I've forgotten the name of the creek. You just follow San Domingo, make a right turn at the end, and that takes you into uh, uh, the back way into St. Michael's and a fisherman's dock, uh, where you can tie up a dinghy. Would that be Waterfront Park, maybe? Sorry, yeah, Waterfront. Yeah, that's possible. That's it. Yeah, that's the name of it, right? But you're right. That's that's a great way to get in there because it's not it's not very heavily crowded, and they have that little dock, which is nice. But you do have to dingy in. There's really no other way of getting in, and it's a really short walk into town. It's not more than a half a mile um, to get to the main downtown area there. That's great. And that's up the little shop tank, if I, my memory is correct. Right, chop tank. No, no, the chop tank. Chop tank. It's up. Uh, it's Broad Creek off the chop tank. Right. And what kind of draft do you need to go in there? Um, uh, we draw a little under five feet. Um, no problem. Um, no, there's ample water uh, until you. Yeah, we had. No, no problem with depth. Um, the only place you begin to run into a problem is if you go too far up the creek towards um, uh, towards uh, the St. Michael's uh, back door. And you'll-, you'll At least seven it. feet up to the split. Sorry? It's at least seven feet up to the split because we had a sloop that came up with us last time and they drew seven feet and they didn't have any problem yeah. until they tried to make that final turn up to St. Michael's. Uh, that may be at high tide. I've never seen yeah. seven feet. I yes, usually, yeah. but whatever, that's fine. Yeah, that's great advice. Because St. Michael's is really worth visiting. It's just, it's tough. It's become so popular and it's just tough to get in there, you know, in the, in t- in, uh, the summer season. So um, that's good. I think just a couple of points I was going to say real quickly about uh, the chop tank. You've got Tredevon, Oxford. There's a bunch of creeks as you pass Oxford that go up that way. It's worth a trip to do that. It's very, very sparsely populated even during the summer months. So it's some good holding bottom up that way. I'm gonna 
chop real quickly talk. I'm Tom, I'm on the Eastern shore heading South now. And just a couple of creeks I was going to mention and Zia brought up a good point. Once you're past the Choptank river, there's not a lot of anchorages all the way down to um, Cape Charles. So you do need to mind your days. Um, and I've kind of gotten burned on this before, especially in the fall when the days are shorter, I have bit off more than I could chew. And I'm entering, you know, dropping the anchor in the Honga River in the dark, which is not very smart on my point, but um, done it many times. So time your, especially come fall, time those, on that, those Eastern Shore passages, time that well, because there's not a lot to anchor. The ones that I've anchored in there very comfortably and the Little Chop Tank River, um, which is south of Chop Tank. So again, you can do Chop Tank to Little Chop Tank, and that could take a good chunk of a day if you're fighting the Bay Current. Once you're up in there, there's an anchorage, which is not too far in the Little Chop Tank. It's called Casson Point, and it's on the northern part of the shore, and it's a very good holding bottom. It looks very exposed, but it's not. It's a good holding bottom, and there's not that many boats that get in there. So that's a nice little anchorage if you're running out of daylight to try and get down the bay. Um, the Honga River is also a nice anchorage. Um, the Honga is, is tough to anchor in, at least my, in my experience. The bottom is really hard. I don't know if it's more clay or, or what exactly makes up the river, but it's a super hard bottom and we had a real hard time getting the anchor to set um, and all the times we've been in the Honga. Um, anyone have any thoughts on that or their experiences in the Honga? Lakes Cove is a great place to anchor, but it is grass, so be careful. Right. Anybody else? Stefan, you, you guys have been in the Honga with your group? Oh, he's muted. Okay. You guys feel free to unmute yourselves. That's what this is all about. Um, so Honga's great. Um, I don't spend a lot of time. So once you're going south from the Honga, you're going down uh, Wakamako, you're going towards Crisfield, um, those areas. And those rivers are a little interesting to explore, but there's not a lot of areas to anchor in there. Um, when we get towards the Crisfield, we just most, there's, a, there's one spot you can anchor inside of the area. It's a basin right by the Coast Guard station. It's room for a couple of boats in there, mm -hmm. but we usually do go to a marina um, just because there's not a lot of places to anchor. There's a lot of work boats and they, and ferries, and they go back and forth and really can, can fly up quite a bit of a wake. So mind the areas if you're going down that way, but Crisfield is definitely worth Crisfield's, it. Stop. Crisfield's community docks are really good. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and if you're gonna anchor in there, do anchor over in front of the Coast Guard. If you get over on the other side, the ferry will either run you over or honk at you mm -hmm. or give you a wake that'll actually shake your teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of challenging in there, but it's, it's fun. It's a fun town to explore for people who like to get out and walk about. Um, but that's I kind just, of wanted to, just wanted to say real quickly when you're heading down that way off the little chop tank is uh, Slaughter Creek. I think it's Slaughter mm -hmm. Creek Marina. And that's a great if you need to stop. We have a little boat. So unless we pack a lot of fuel, we can't make it all the way um, all the way down to Crisfield. And so um, but Slaughter Creek is a great little there's a great anchorage back in there. It's a really nice protected. But then also that marina is a really nice little kind of hideaway as well. Yeah, well I was in Slaughter Creek last fall and um, it's very shallow and the marina was very silted in and I didn't particularly didn't like the experience. It was couldn't get into a slip that's right uh, because we wound up tying up halfway in and halfway out and waited for high tide to get out the following morning. It was interesting. It was we were there in well July. Marina. We were there in early July, so I'm and we didn't have any problems. So I'm wondering if maybe they had some storm that brought something in, you know, halfway down or something. That was really because we didn't have that problem. But yeah, yeah, my understanding was Slaughter Creek, and I personally have never been into it because we are we draw too much to go in there. Um, is that you need to have pretty much local knowledge and kind of mind your markers as you go in there. But I have told once you get in there, it's it's nice. It's, it's a nice area, but I guess it depends on the time of year. But yeah, that's a good one. That's up on the Chop Tank, Little Chop Tank River. Um, and heading south, so a couple more things I want to point out before I get down to Cape Henry. Um, Tangier and Smith Islands, if you guys get a chance to do that and explore those islands, I would highly recommend you do that. Getting in is a challenge to both islands. If you draw more than five feet, you're going to have difficulty getting in. Um, Parks Marina is the only place, and you need to get a marina in, in both places. Parks is the one on Tangier, Mr. Park. He's got a couple slips in there. 
But keep in mind, once you're into this part of Chesapeake Bay, it's quite tidal. You really got to mind your tides and your currents. And it, it can be challenging. There's, there's no anchoring that I know of that's around Tangier, unless somebody knows something I don't know. Um, it's very deep um, on certain sections of the island, around the island. Once you get in there, again, it's a thoroughfare that you go in there. But it's, if you draw more than five feet, I don't know that I'd recommend trying to get in there. Anybody have thoughts on Tangier and Smith Islands that they want to share with the group? We always stop at Smith Island when we come in, but if you have to go to the northeast corner to uh, anchor, uh, if you do, it'll keep you out of the current and out of the traffic. There's no place to land on that corner, though, and we have a dog as well. Um, so if you take your dinghy, you have to go around to the east side to get up onto shore. Uh, it's a little bit marshy, but it's very shoaly and about one to two feet once you're in close. So you'll anchor a little ways out, but you can anchor in the northeast corner very safely. It's protected. Okay, that's off of Smith, right? That's correct. Okay, off good. Of Smith. okay good. Anybody else have something you want to add about that? They're great islands to explore. I, I really well, encourage you to do it if you can. We took a cruise in in into that area last year and wound up staying in Chrisfield, which has which has some very nice uh, municipal marina, um, very friendly place, and then. Some of us took the ferry over to Tanger. Um, it avoided some of the problems of anchoring in Smith and Tanger um, and, and gave us a very pleasant stay in Chrisfield. That's an excellent idea. When you, when you say very tidal, what are you getting for tidal changes in that area? It, it tends, depends on the time of year, but I've seen one to two feet tidal in that area and sometimes a little bit more depending on where the moon if it's a full moon I um, mean what part of the year it is but I've seen a fair amount of tide and it's surprising and you know it, you don't notice it because some of those areas are the rivers are so long that you're not really paying attention so you're like well I'm on the ground I'm on the bottom you know how did that happen I have to wait till the tide to get off but um yeah I've seen one to two feet in, in that general area um Two other places before I uh, turn it over to Joan for Norfolk and Hampton. Also a caution, don't fall it. Finally. Don't what? Uh, caution on Tangiers is don't follow the fishing fleet out. Right. There's a lot of local knowledge cuts that are in there, but I'm talking about you need to know the local knowledge. Uh, yeah. It is uh, very tight and they shoal very fast. So don't follow a fishing boat out just because he went that way. Right, that's a really good point because those guys don't draw a whole lot, and uh, the rest of us do. Um, I was going to so actually ask if there's some way that we could have the the Smith and those islands, uh, Christopher, like that whole area, written down somewhere because I know, I know that, that this last summer when we were doing our trip, we spent a lot of time researching, trying to figure out where we could and could not go, and it's really hard to find any local information unless you luck on something like this. So if if that's something that we could have written down from members, it would be super helpful. <laughs> yeah, we could we could look into doing that. I think Frank had a good point that, you know, really, if you're gonna go in there, if you need to well, go under- It's feet. actually that whole arc from blood. Wait. It's Frank, actually that good. whole arc from Bloodsworth Island all the way down to Tangier Island. That whole area down through there, you need to really either know it or pay really close attention. Yeah, but it's a, if you get into Tangier, the one thing about Tangier that's wonderful, again, if you can get in, Mr. Park is delightful. He's an older guy and he runs the marina, the only marina in Tangier, and he's very helpful. So if you draw you know, under four feet, I don't think you're going to have too much trouble. If you go in, you're going to enter it from the bay entrance side, um, not the sound side, the bay side. You'll come in and out both directions on that side. Um, it's hard to get in the other way. But if you do come in, Tangier Island is worth it. There's, there's no motorized vehicles on that island. Um, except for golf. everybody goes by golf carts and there is a, about a five mile white sand beach on the southern end of that island and the water's almost turquoise. It's gorgeous. Makes you think you're in the Caribbean. It's a beautiful and there's nobody there. Um, I do know in late summer, it's pretty, pretty, uh, there's a lot of flies. <laughs> so you know, may not want to do that in August, but in the fall and uh, early spring, it's really a beautiful place to go. And I really encourage you to go there. Um, someone else brought it, something someone mentioned earlier to take the ferry from Chrisfield and that's an option too. There's a ferry and then there's the mail boat that goes over. So it's, it's a great town to spend a day and there's, there's, it's, it's beautiful. Somebody um, asked for uh, sources of local information um, for this area and uh, there's, there's a digital version, cruising guide called Active Captain. Some of mm -hmm. you may know it, um, which 
uh, records um, the experiences of lots of people uh, who've been to these different places, and it's uh, very helpful. Uh, it has reviews of marinas and, and uh, similar information. That's great. Thank you. I forgot about that completely. I don't, I don't generally use that, but I know a lot of people do. Crowdsourcing um, right up. Exactly. A um, couple other places, um, Onancock Creek, if anyone, so we're heading down towards Cape Charles. Again, we're on the eastern shore heading south. Onancock is about a seven mile creek that terminates in the town of Onancock. It's, it's worth the trip. It, there's, I, I can't describe, there's no words for it. Um, it's a small town marina. I think there's about maybe 10, 12 slips in there. Um, there's one little anchorage right outside and you can anchor there and it's worth exploring. It's a small town. There's maybe about, there's right by the town dock. There's two or three small little restaurants and a ship store and- um, And a movie. Yes, you're right. Yeah, definitely. Right. And the movie. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's it's a. I highly recommend exploring an area. It's what, worth the trip. What's it called again? I'm sorry. Oh, Onanca Creek. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. I know the the, the pronunciation gets a little odd in some of those areas. It's Onanca, and it mm -hmm. ends. It's, it's an Anca Creek, and it ends in the town of Onanca. And you can't yeah. go past. There's a fixed bridge. So. Oh, is that O N A N C O C K? That's correct. Yes. That's definitely worth a trip. And then last well, but not least, skinny channel. It, is, it, is, it, it looks skinny, but it's not that skinny. You can get in there. Yeah, um, there is spot uh, to anchor right. uh, safely, and uh, it's an easy dinghy ride. And there's like a, a dinghy dock, town dock, that gives you easy access, walking access to the town. Good restaurants, yeah. a fantastic hardware store, and there's a movie. Right. It's really it's, it's, it's worth been a few years since I've been up that creek, but it's pretty well marked. The channel, um, it's you're not you're not going up blind. Just follow the markers, and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well, it certainly deep. looks well. I'm I'm I've just pulled up Open CPN, and I've got Google Open CPN running, so it certainly looks well marked. Well, you it's see, it well also marked. has a good outer cha channel marker on the day beacon, and so it, you follow the sticks in, and it works fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easily doable. I know that uh, the sailing vessel uh, Woodwind, which is the big schooner, um, after the Chesapeake Bay races, she tucks up in there. So she can get her 65-foot boat up in there. And she anchors at that, that uh, I think, Bill, you mentioned that little anchorage right before the town dock. That's where she anchors. And it's you can easy dinghy in there. So that's that's great. But it's worth the trip. So, Mark, you guys should mark that on your, your itinerary. All right, last but not least is Cape Charles. Um, and that's the last of the Eastern Shore anchorages. Now, Cape Charles is, is really also something you guys should put on your list um, because Cape Charles, it's it's easy and there's there's two marinas once you get in there. One, I believe, is a public marina. The other one's private. They're both very in nice shape. One um, port. Correct. And the Coast Guard station's right smack dab in the middle, but you're right at the town. So once you come into those marinas, the town's right there. And there's a lot of things to do. There's a beautiful park. Um, there's beautiful beaches. And when you guys, if you guys have been down to Cape Charles, you know this, you're, it's white sand. It's, it's, it's a sandy, but sandy area. It's beautiful. You almost feel like you're, you're heading out into the, to the ocean, which I guess technically you are, but um, I highly recommend doing that. There is a marina that is in Cape Charles called, um, oh, I forgot the name of it already. It's uh, Oyster Farm Marina. It's probably the most luxurious marina I've stayed in the Chesapeake Bay. If you want to be pampered, it is outstandingly gorgeous with floating docks. However, if you draw more than four feet, you're going to have a hard time getting in there and they don't dredge it. Um, but if you do go to Cape, if you go, if you do get to uh, Cape Charles, um, making your way up to that area by bike is even worth a trip. It, it's really a, a neat area to explore. So, so that's it for the Eastern shore. Unless anybody's got any questions from the Bay Bridge on down of any of my haunts that I go to. Um, we usually spend two weeks um, in the fall. My husband and I used to take two weeks and we go from our port here in Bodkin Creek um, all the way down the eastern shore and then come up the western shore. And that's two weeks and we could do a month of doing that. There's just so many things to explore. So I'm going to turn it over to Joan. Joan, if you can get the intel on Norfolk and Hampton Roads as to where we should be in that area. Okay. Um, I'm Joan Conover. We live down in the Hampton area. And we sail that area. We also sail offshore, but talking of the Hampton and Chesapeake Bay areas, 
Uh, we will have a webinar on March 24th. It's free. The city of Hampton is doing that, talking about their changes and what's going on there. Um, I invite you all to attend that one. They're putting it on. And I think it's uh, good to hear about the dock. There's a little bit of anchorage in front of the, the public docks. There is a Blue Water uh, Marina. There is Sunset Marina. There's Joy's Marina, um, all there. Then there is also Mill Creek Anchorage, which is at Fort Monroe. Anyone with kids will like that one. Um, they can go explore the fort, but also there's a new dinghy dock just to the north of Mill Creek, the other side of the bridge and a nice parking area, but it takes you up to the shopping area of Phoebus is walking distance. Then around to the outside heading north, um, there's Salt Ponds Marina, which is very interesting because they have a $1.25 a foot if you're a Boat USA member, and they have room for catamarans. Um, it's a very private area. Um, you could paddleboard in there. It's kind of uh, salt marshy. It's called Salt Ponds for a reason. It's well marked going in. Um, to the south into Hampton down the Elizabeth River, which is the route that people take, the ICW, that's well marked on the waterways guide. In fact, um, Ted Steele does a wonderful job keeping up on that because we have bridge openings, bridge closers, all kinds of stuff happening down that river. But anchoring at Hospital Point or going into Portsmouth on the way south, Portsmouth Public Docks is free. You can go in there and tie up. They've still got things going on. There is COVID, you gotta wear masks, but um, there are things you can do there, the anchorage. There's Waterside Marina on the far side. And then as you get down near the locks on the far side of the locks, there's free anchorages on the one side. And there is, uh, on the other side, there's Atlantic Yachts. And then you head south from there. Heading north up the bay on the west side, we like to stop at uh, several different bays. Uh, Mobjack Bay has several different anchorages depending on the weather. We like that going in. I will say that before you go anywhere in the bay, download new charts from NOAA. Download new, I would get um, aqua maps. They have the US Army Corps of Engineers bathymetric data very nicely. It goes with, will work with your Navonics or whatnot. They're actually developing almost a chart plotter that works on your cell phone or your tablet. And I use everything in the bay. We have a 51 uh, foot sailboat with a 65 foot mast. We're big, we're heavy, we're a 51 Morgan. Um, we pull six foot loaded, which we usually are. And um, there's places I just can't go into. We like Mobjack Bay, we like Fishing Bay, because also in Fishing Bay, there are um, some good uh, marinas for repair and stuff. A lot of people go there. We like uh, Deltaville, we like um, the Solomons, and we like to stop if we're heading from Norfolk North, we'll make it to the Potomac in one day. And we stop on the north side at Cornfield Harbor, beautiful white sand anchorage. There are lobster pots, you have, or not lobster, um, crab yeah. pots you have to watch for. Um, but it is a nice white anchorage, sand. And that sand, I think, is from a long ago um, strike by something that had a lot of heat in it that made that nice white crystal sand. Um, but then from north, we go up to Solomons. Normally, we're usually booking it north or south for a reason. So we'll go uh, Potomac, and then we'll go up to, for example, Rhodes River. We like that area. Um, and we sail with three dogs. We sail to Caribbean. We sail to Cuba with three dogs, uh, little ones. Now we have four, but they're trained to pee pads, so we don't have to take them off the boat. Um, if there's any questions, if you come down to Hampton, I'm there. I'm at Salt Ponds Marina. We have a slip there where our boat is. Um, we are gone in the, in the, usually in the season down to the Caribbean a lot, but we've been sitting here because of COVID. Um, any questions on the area? I'm gonna be helping Hampton with their events. We will be doing a gathering in May for boats coming north. And then we're going to be doing a meander the Chesapeake, which this webinar helps a lot with. And then we're doing a heading north to Maine webinar on the 26th of March, where we have our cruising hosts up in Maine and up in uh, the northern areas of the Northwest US, Northeast US, talking about their harbors, their ports, how to get there, and something about it. Um, 
I will mention on the St. Charles, the marina there, there has been some ownership changes. I think I heard that the city get, turned it over to someone else, but I, I don't know that for sure because I haven't been over there recently. Uh, Kittipec Beach is a beautiful place if you have kids, as long as they don't have their crab farm sitting there. Because if the crab farm's sitting there, they got all those buoys and you can't anchor, but it's a beautiful state park um, and a beach and the kids can go there and you can anchor and it's got those concrete boats sitting there, they're breaking up the weather. And it's just fun to watch. You can sit there and, and at uh, dawn or dusk and watch all of these pelicans and birds all over. It reminds me of water world, you know? You mm -hmm. sit there and pretend you've gone back to uh, or ahead in the future. If there, again, if there's any questions for the Southern Bay, we're starting to do webinars for that. A lot of them are free. So just go to WWSSCA and I'll turn it back to Beth. Okay, good. That was great overview of that area down there. I don't get down to Hampton too often. Um, Frank, you, you have a lot of knowledge on the Potomac River and the Potomac, for those of you who've crossed the Potomac, um, it deserves healthy respect. It's a very big river. It's very tidal and there's a lot of current. Um, I typically only go up in that area if I'm running out of daylight and I need to just drop the hook for the night, but I don't know it well. So Frank, can you give us some intel on the Potomac? Well, like you said, it's a very fast moving body of water. Um, if you come all the way down from the Occoquan, you can hit some really beautiful little inlets. But just remember, because it's a current and tidal both, you uh, need to pay really close attention to your anchorage. Uh, a lot of silt on the north side, a lot of mud on the south side, but the mud tends to be aqueous mud. So when you drop your hook in there, it'll dig in really nice. But because of hydraulics overnight, you can actually loosen itself as the current moves you around. So again, just pay close attention when you're anchoring. Um, one of the things to pay attention to, if you're not going up the Potomac when you come up the Chesapeake Bay, I would move over to the eastern uh, side, to the Maryland side, and just stay away from it. It uh, will actually mess up your timing, uh, and it's also almost always bumpy right there at the mouth when you're coming around that area, all the way up to point, no point. Um, because you have the current coming down, and you either have the tide coming in, so you have tide against current, or you have the current coming down and the tide going out and so it's really ripping through there. However, there is one really good storm runaway hole right there at the mouth called Smith Creek. Uh, if you pull up in there, it's a little bit of a navigation exercise to get in there. Pull in, stay in between the sticks, uh, make a hard left, make a hard right, and you'll be up in the creek that's protected on uh, all four sides. There are two bays to port uh, pick either one. They're about nine feet deep. They are uh, mud over kaolin clay. So no matter what you're using, you'll find something to hook into there. Um, that if you use a bruce or some sort of scoop anchor, uh, that would work well for the top four feet of mud. Or if you use a plow, you'll go all the way down to the uh, kaolin and hook in. So you're not going anywhere, but it's uh, covered all the way around no matter what the weather is. So we really like that one as a storm hole. Uh, if you little, look a little bit further south of the Potomac, you'll find Fleets Bay. Uh, that's also another nice place to uh, run away in a storm. As you can tell, we, uh, we tend to stay out and moving and whatnot. So we'll, we'll go and anchor uh, in any number of places. But if the weather turns ugly, I just assume get in one of these little storm holes. Uh, they work really well. Uh, Joan, I don't know if you want to talk about the Sarah or the York River or anything over there. There's some nice, beautiful anchorages over there that you've got uh, nice scenery, both from ashore and also out. And you've also got the historical areas of Yorktown and uh, Williamsburg and all of that. Uh, the York River Bridge uh, opens. The, the bridge master's at Cantankerous guy named Paul. Uh, he will open it. I just don't plan on getting there in the morning or the evening rush hour because uh, then he's not going to open it unless you show up with a court order or you're a vessel in emergency distress. Um, Chrisfield, by the way, does have a management company now that's contracted to the city and they're very nice, very laid back and will do anything for you. Uh, the restaurant there is also still pretty good, but you got to go into Chrisfield and see the whole town. Uh, I mean, the drugstore with the stools at the counter kind of place. I mean, it's the little breakfast area there is wonderful. Anyway, so much for that announcement. Yeah. Um, sorry, John. Yeah, York River. There's a, a for for those of, who want to see the history. 
Um, it's a wonderful place to go in on that on that side of the peninsula. Um, there's Jamestown. Uh, there's you know good transportation. Um, there's facilities in that area. Um, if you come around the opposite side and go James River north, well, you can get up there, but you got again, you have a bridge to raise. It's a 55 foot bridge. Why they didn't do 65, I don't know. Um, so it has to lift for us and everybody hates us if we do that because we live on the other side of the bridge. So our boat's on the opposite side. Um, James River is an interesting gunk holding place, but it's not deep. Um, there's also uh, Smithfield. If you have a shallow draft, it's a wonderful little marina to go in there and a wonderful little town to walk through. Um, but again, uh, five foot is questionable. Um, it's shoaled in and it's not shown on some of the charts, but a uh, fun area to go meandering around. Um, on the going a bit north to the Potomac, I'd recommend nobody think of anchoring on the south side of the Potomac at the mouth because boy, will you get lumps. We got stuck there once. And no, you don't want to do boat. that. Yeah, we got a big boat. We got stuck there uh, because of some issue and anchored there, but we had to have uh, someone on the boat all, all 24 hours a day while because everything was lumpy. It wasn't fun, um, but we got our problem fixed and then we <laughs> went on. Do not do that. If you're going to... Yeah. Go ahead, Frank. If you're going to get stuck in the south part of the Potomac, I recommend you button hook around Smith Point and go into Reedville. There's a really good anchorage right in front of the Menhaden plant there. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it in high, hot summer or bring your nose plugs uh, because yes, processing is a, a little bit aromatic. But uh, the issue is, is it's a very well protected anchorage right there in front of the Menhaden plant. And it gets you out of the weather. If you don't try to anchor on the south side of the Potomac, that's just dangerous. And also, like Joan was saying, extraordinarily lumpy. That's the latest I've heard that, Joan. Uh, two thoughts. Um, one is uh, it, alternative to Reedville is Ingram Bay. And uh, Ingram Bay, um, there is a nice little marina there. Uh, we got in. It's a, it's, a, it's a channel you might not want to do at mean low water. Um, uh, but they, the, the marina right inside Ingram Bay has a courtesy uh, car. They'll, uh, there's nothing there. Uh, you have to drive five miles to go out to a restaurant or something, but um, really nice people. And the second thing, uh, what you said about the southern mouth of the Potomac, uh, when we were coming up, we got hit uh, with a bunch of thunderstorms and stuff, and we found that Smith Creek uh, on the north shore uh, of the mouth of, well, a couple of miles in from the mouth uh, and went around and there's a nice uh, marina with bulkhead, with decent water bulkhead docking as well as slips and we're small catamaran. So the bulkhead worked really well. Um, Smith Point, I believe it's called. And it's, and a, and as uh, Frank had said, it, it's a little bit of a curly Q in, but uh, once you're there, it, it was a great relief to be uh, protected from the storms. Yeah, Smith Creek has a fork in it. You take the right fork and you'll go over to the marina, you take the port side fork, and you'll go up to a couple of coves. When you see the really big house on the hill, you're at those coves. Just pick one, and it's they're very well protected and very comfortable. You can get a good night's rest there. Reedville, we have a host in, Keith Davis. I was hoping he would attend today, um, but he's there if you have questions um, on that particular anchorage. There's little gun coaling places. You can go up there. You just got to watch your depth. Back where Jane's Marine used to be, back up in that starboard channel, is a great place to pull up in there and anchor because uh, they excavated that all out when the marina was there. And then when the marina went away, then, of course, the anchorage is still in place. Do we have anybody still on the, the meeting from Harrington Harbor? Yeah, I'm still here. Still here. So question I always had about, because, you know, Harrington Harbor, it's a big, Herring Bay is a big area. Is there any anchoring right in that bay? Yes, there is. Um, there are a couple of pl places where where the, bo the holding is not great because it's sand and you have a tough time um, getting an anchor to set. Um, I think 
the places that, that uh, I've seen most boats anchored at is at the north end of Herring Bay, um, just outside the channel into Harrington Harbor North. But there's a lot of red, rocking rolling. Is that right uh, before the marina? Sorry? Is it right before the marina? Herring yes. Harbor. Okay. Right yeah, and like, our home base is, is Harrington Harbor North, and um, it's a lovely marina, probably the nicest on the East Coast. If you're looking for a, a pleasant place to stay and services, uh, that's a good place to go. But you, you have to remember, if you're going to go and anchor out there, you're right along the channel, or near the channel where all the boats go in and out of the marinas, and you're going to get some, particularly power boats, racing in and out of there. You're going to get some rocking and rolling in there. Mm -hmm. I anchor in Herring Bay probably at least twice a year, if not more often, and they're right. However, there's a way to do it. If you look at the last green marker before you go into Herring Bay, go just beyond it, and there's a little dip off to the port side uh, in front of some really nice big houses. But that whole curved in area takes you out of the navigable channel, and it's a good place to anchor. You're in about eight to nine feet of water, and it holds very well. If you go a little bit further south than that marker, you'll see a swim platform out there that's sticking out from the, the community right there. If you anchor out in front of that swim platform, it's very good holding and you're also out of the channel. That uh, reef wall that runs between North and South Harrington, east of the uh, channel, protects all the waves coming in. You'll get some surface crap, but you won't get any really big waves. The whole Herring Harbor area is a great place to anchor. That's always our stopping point when we're heading north or south. Yeah, well, thanks, you're talking about the sandbar. That for us. Yeah, the sandbar. Right. Oh, please tell. <laughs> Sandbars are important. Well, well no, it's, it, the channel runs behind it, so you're in good shape. Just stay with exactly. the marks. Okay. Do not cut the mark short going in there and watch out for the fish weir. But other than that. Yeah, as I always say, if you've not run aground in the Chesapeake, you've never sailed the Chesapeake. And that is so very true. Um, so a couple things, and then we're kind of running to the end here. This is a, a few things, just like John mentioned. Um, Seven Seas has cruising hosts up and down the Chesapeake Bay, and you can find them on the Seven Seas website. And they're local folks. I'm up in Bodkin Creek, and I'm actually on the water in Bodkin Creek. So if you're ever in Bodkin, which is just north of um, the Magathy. A lot of people don't come in there because it doesn't look like you can get in there, but it's, there's a couple of really nice anchorages in there. And if you ever got up in that area and you need to stop on, you need to let your dog use my backyard or just stop and say, hello, I'm, I'm up in Bodkin. So I'm on the Seven Seas uh, site. It's the hosts are great because they have a lot of local information um, for the Bay. And I was gonna also mention, I totally forgot about this. Frank mentioned this a couple of times sticks and you guys will see this when you're going especially on the Virginia shore I didn't know if that was a unique thing to Virginia but oftentimes you're going as tiny little creeks on the Virginia shore they don't have markers they have just sticks and I never knew what they were until I looked at my chart and go oh my god they're marking the shoal they're not marked there's no marker to them so when you get in those areas and you see these little sticks sticking out of the water that's the, the way of their marking their creek. So that's how they do it down there. They don't have red, red green markers. They may have it at the main entrance of the creek and that's it. You're on your own after that. So that's what the sticks are for those of you who didn't know that. And I didn't know what they were. A lot of them are made of plastic. It looks kind of odd, but they're, they're still. Actually it's PV, this PVC pipe that they pounded down in there, but yeah, just watch for those <laughs> yes. particularly on the uh, tributaries. Yeah, those are the markers. Um, anyone have anything else they want to add to your favorite anchorages? I know we skipped over a lot of stuff. We could do this another session. Um, we could just dedicate one whole part to the Eastern Shore, which is fun. But um, feel free to contact anybody who's on the Zoom. I think my information's on the web too. But um, I, I spent a lot of time on the Eastern Shore and love it. Joan, again, just to plug for Joan's event that she's going to be doing. Joan, is it the end of the month for the main? You're muted. You're muted. There you wow. go. So no one wanted to hear my dogs bark, maybe. Um, the 26th of March is Maine. And that is going to be talking of going up to Maine, some the route offshore, and then all the little gunk holing places as you get up there. And we've got people on the ground who know Maine, who's done the route, and are current. They're there right now. Um, the problem I find a lot of times is someone has information but it's kind of stale and right now with COVID there's so many things that have changed or businesses that 
used to be there that are kind of not there or have changed their rules, you've got to know that. Same for fuel, same for everything else. So waterway guide stays updated. Um, and we're doing that for Maine. Just We've got almost uh, well over 50 people already signed up for it. We'll cut it at 100. So if someone else wants to join, they better do it soon. Also, Town of Hampton will be doing a webinar on the 24th. And that's all on our SSCA website. Just keep watching that. We've got a lot of different um, webinars coming up on different topics, what I call pop-up. Someone wants to know how to communicate. Well, there's cell phone near shore and offshore, that kind of stuff. We have um, a webinar on a Chesapeake Bay app called Argo that will be on the 8th of April. Frank's nodding. That was uh, our power squadron leader up in, uh, uh, I think, was she in Annapolis, Frank? Priscilla is now in is Annapolis. Yeah, Priscilla, Priscilla is now in Annapolis. Yeah, um, she saw the uh, presentation and really liked it. It's a social app, but very heavily um, regarding current uh, Chesapeake Bay pieces. And it's free. I like free. Uh, works on your cell phone. But Beth, I'll turn this back over to you. We do this every month. Thank you very much, Beth. It's a lot of work to do oh, this every month. And thank you for Joan for setting us up. This is great. Again, we meet, like I said, second Saturday of the month. We try to put the topic out like week before what we're going to talk about and um, it's open to everybody and it's free. And again, thanks for, and welcome to the Harrington Harbor folks who are uh, zooming in today with us. It's, it's been great to get to know you guys and connect with everybody down there. So, all right, everybody had, anybody have anything else to say? Otherwise I'll just go ahead and end our lunch. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. A lot. Um, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, to, thanks to Joyce and Zia for your presentation. That was yeah. great. Yeah, it and was you great. Can see this Thank you. recorded on YouTube. Because All right, guys. Training. Have a great day. Get out and play. Okay. Okay. There we go. Bye now.